fine. How are you doing? Pretty good, thanks. Good, uh, good. This is so surreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little weird when it's when you're used to seeing me on that screen, and now I'm actually talking to you. So I know it's kind of nerve wracking. Yeah, it's a little weird at first. You'll <laughs> get over it. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well tell me Easter, a little bit about yourself. Way. Go ahead. Well, well, let me wish you happy Easter, first of all. Well, thank you, and happy Easter to you, too. Thank you. I, I enjoyed uh, Freddie's rendition of Christ the Lord is Risen Today. <laughs> I love it when he raps hymns. <laughs> it's much better than when he sings them. Um, and the, the, funny, the funny thing is that we had our own little mishap with that song yesterday in oh, church. Really? <laughs> yeah, so... So a friend and I were leading worship, and, um, and we didn't have that song in our set list. Um, so we hadn't practiced it. We hadn't sent it to the person who does the PowerPoints. But, um, and we do two services back to back, and it didn't show up in the first service. But the second service, it suddenly showed up on screen towards the end. <laughs> and we were trying to look at each other, and the pastor's like, you know, beckoning us up. So, all right. So we just went up and played it. But you know, you know how hymns can have anything from like four verses to 73 verses, right? That's right. And so we had no idea how many verses the person had put in. So <laughs> we kind of thought we were at the end. And so we did the little, you know, the final slow strum. Yep. And then the person pressed, pressed the button and the next slide came up. So we had to start again. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened a couple more times. So... Uh, but it was great. It was great. The whole congregation was laughing by the end. So. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you must be a worship leader. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of in charge of, uh, of setting the rota. I mean, that's pretty much all it is. Okay. Um, like your church, or like it sounds uh, from what you've said, it's not the most glamorous uh, <laughs> set up but uh we're glamorous at living stones (laughs) make make a joyful noise that's right that's right so um yeah so so it's actually it's an anglican church which is uh which is kind of cool i didn't grow up in the anglican church um but uh yeah but i've been worshiping there for the last five years um since i got here so wonderful and where are you i'm in morocco in casablanca yeah yeah yeah. Wow. That sounds pretty so, wild. Now, what brought you there? Oh, so, um, so I was actually born in Morocco. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. My parents met here in the 70s and got married here. And my siblings and I were all born here. Um, yeah, so we left pretty early when I was three. Um, and I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Um, yeah, but then about... Um, and so I, I taught English. Uh, after college, I taught English in a few different countries for a year or two. Um, and then about five years ago, I decided to, to try coming back here, get back to my roots. Wow. So, what are yeah. you doing for work? Uh, so I teach English as a second language okay. and Spanish too. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I've never been to Morocco. I'm going to have to get there. Yeah, you should. You should. Yeah, honestly. Like, and and I, I was thinking it, um, I've really enjoyed your videos and, and the conversations too, especially. Um, and you know, if any, if, if this does go on YouTube, um, this is like an open invitation. If anyone, uh, wants to come to Morocco, I'd be happy to, you know, show them around and and help them out if they come here. So I will tell my wife since the Australia trip, my wife's had the travel bug. So I'll say, honey, you want to go to Morocco? We got someone to show us around. Definitely. Definitely. All right. I'll let her know. So, um, yeah, um, I guess a little bit about myself. Well, I, I kind of already told you <clears throat> my brief biography. Um, so, so, as I said, I, I didn't grow up in the Ang- Anglican church. Uh, my mom was a Christian and Missionary Alliance growing up. Uh, and my dad, who's from Scotland, grew up in the Church of Scotland. So very Presbyterian. Yeah. Um, so we grew up in house churches in Saudi um, so, yeah, with, with other uh, foreigners. So it was a really, yeah, it was a really cool kind of experience because it was people from all different denominations and nationalities. Um, you know, I had some Southern Baptists there, some Pentecostals from Brazil, some uh, even, you know, Seventh-day Adventists. So, yeah, it was a really kind of neat mix. 
Um, so, so I would say that was, that was kind of the background I was growing up in. Um, the reason I ended up at the Anglican Church here is more just because there's not much choice for English language services in yeah. Casablanca. Yeah. 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 So, so when, I, when I first got here, I, I went to the International Protestant Church. Mm-hmm. Um, but the day I arrived, the, the pastor was away. And it happened to be coincide with um, Nigeria National Day or something. <laughs> and there, there's, there's a large Nigerian population there. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was very Nigeria centric. Um, so, mm-hmm. so, so I was just kind of like, what is this? Um, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll try out the Anglican church. Um, so I went there the next week um, and, you know, people were very welcoming. And so I kind of just slipped into that community. Um, it's, it's actually a really cool church. It was, um, it was built like in the, in 1906 and uh, it's where General Patton and his troops uh, worshipped when they were stationed in Casablanca during World War II. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. But, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So it's this tiny chapel. Um, well, it's not, it's not that tiny. I guess it seats about, you know, 80 or 100 people. But uh, that's crammed into the pews, you know. So. Well, it's, you know, in, even in Santo Domingo, when I lived in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, I spent most of my years in the Dominican Republic in Barahona, which is a small town. But in Santo Domingo, there's almost any capital city in any place in the world, there'll be an English language church or two. And they develop their own cultures, these churches. And I, I really love them. They, yeah. They're so... I mean, it's so interesting because you've got obviously people from all over the world with all of their different Christian traditions, all kind of put into one space, and they have to be church together. And yes. I think there's something so beautiful about that. There is, there is. And it's, it's, it's funny too, you know, it's, it's amusing because you can see where all the different kind of strains are coming in. Um, yep. so al- although it's Anglican, our, our priest, I guess, is what you'd call him. I call him pastor, but um, <laughs> he's, he's Egyptian. Um, and, you know, we've got a large population of Nigerians and Liberians, yeah. um, Koreans, Filipinos, Australians, Canadians, Americans. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's, yeah, obviously it's, it's got its troubles, um, but. Uh, always, the, there are always troubles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, you know, one interesting thing with the whole um, kind of Jordan Peterson movement and, and everything that surrounded that is, and, and, you know, you've mentioned this too, young people kind of who are in the church getting back into sort of sacramentalism. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's really interesting that I kind of, you know, unwittingly, well, not wittingly, but not intentionally entered into that kind of atmosphere before I discovered Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Peugeot and you, um, mm-hmm. et cetera. So it was really at the beginning, it was kind of, um, uncomfortable for me, you know, all the liturgy, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. like lamb of God, have mercy on us or lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, grant us your peace, all that stuff. I, mm-hmm. It felt kind of uncomfortable. Um, but over time I, I really kind of grew to like it. Um, and, and as the pastor himself, pointed out, um, it's, it's kind of an interdenominational or non-denominational church with Anglican, that, that kind of follows the Anglican pattern of services. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's really kind of a cool uh, mix of, of things. Oh, that's, it, sounds, it sounds delightful. When I was in Australia, so the church that all of the conferences that I did in Australia were held in was an Anglican church. And it was an Anglican church that quite intentionally continues the historic Anglican liturgies, as opposed to many of the other Anglican church in Australia that have sort of gone the way of contemporary Christianity in America and a lot of these other places. And I told the pastor, because he kind of feels a little, you know, all by himself in that. I said, there's a wave coming and it's, it's going to be liturgy and sacraments and stuff that you can touch and stuff that you can taste and things on yeah. paper that you read. That's very big in California. And when we started doing church plants, they were mostly the, the big sound contemporary kind. And they've all gone to weekly communion 
more formal liturgy, so on and so forth. Living Stones is kind of the exception, but we're really exceptional in so many ways that we're, um, we, it's just different at Living Stones because we're, a, every, every group of people has to do, has to worship via their zip code and the unique mix of people that are there, so. Right, right. Yeah, it was, um, I, I went to the church synod for our archdeaconry a couple years ago. Um, and that was in, in southern Spain. Um, and, you know, it was all those communities were sort of older retirees who live in Spain and go to Anglican churches there. So it was much more traditional, the services that we had during the synod. Hmm. And for me, it's, it's still that's kind of one step too far. You know, like I, I really like Jonathan Peugeot's videos and I, I really appreciate the symbolism uh, that really appeals to me, that kind of thing. But, but I'm still more comfortable. I'm still more at home with the, the kind of Anglican light, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, I, I've been meaning to ask you, what took you out to Sacramento? Like from, I, I know you, you grew up in New Jersey and you went to like Calvin uh, College or Calvin Seminary. How, how did you end up out in Sacramento? Well, we, when we came home from the Dominican Republic, we needed to do something else. And in the Christian Reformed Church, there, there aren't any bishops in the Christian Reformed Church. And so churches are kind of independent brokers. And when a church doesn't have a pastor and they're looking for one, they search. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, actually, this church was vacant, as they call it in our nomenclature. And they were interested in my father because someone who had been an interim pastor here said, oh, Stan Vanderclay would be good for this neighborhood. But my father was four years from retirement and they had bought a condo in Massachusetts on the East Coast. And, and my father's like, my father was very high in openness. He'd like, California sounds like fun. And my mother's <laughs> like, she's, my mother's not high in openness. She said, oh, fun, you can go alone. And it wasn't about to go <laughs> alone. So then he said, why don't you talk to my son instead of me? And so that's how they found me. And I actually had two offers, one to a church in Chicago and one to this church. And I uh, very, very much felt the call to this church. This church had some important similarities to my father's work. It was an inner city work. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks from the African-American community, but always kind of a, a different church. It wasn't a standard church for white folks or CRC folks or black folks. It's kind of an alternative mm -hmm. church. That's what my father's church was growing up and this church was too. So it was a good fit for me. And mm -hmm. I felt very home at here right away. And so I've been here, it'll be 22 years this summer. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love California. I love Sacramento. It's, you know, I, it's a great place to be. Raised my kids here. I lived in Reading for a year. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My sister and brother-in-law um, opened up a business out there. and they're, they're no longer there, but um, I was with them when they opened up the business. N not, not the biggest fan of Reading. <laughs> um, well, see, the Central Valley is this big, it's this big dugout canoe, basically. And Sacramento is right by the Delta. So it gets hot during the summer, but at night, the, the Delta breeze comes up the Delta and cools Sacramento. So at nighttime, it'll get down into the 70s. It'll be comfortable. You get to oh, Redding yeah. or Fresno or Bakersfield, oh, you man, just that was fuck. Oh, it was awful. Yeah. It was awful. So I, yeah. I, I wouldn't, sorry for any listeners in Redding or Fresno or Bakersfield, but I like yeah. Sacramento because it cools down at night, even in the brutality of the Central Valley summer. Yeah, they, they, had a, a, they owned a convenience store and, you know, the chocolate was melting, literally melting on the shelves. Oh, yeah. when the air conditioner went out. So, yeah. yeah. No. yeah. Um, well, if you don't mind, um, let me tell you how I kind of discovered Jordan Peterson and how I got into this whole I'd love, thing. I'd love to hear. Yeah, so um, basically a couple of years ago, um, I was visiting my brother and his family um, in New Zealand, and he played a clip for us of Camille Paglia, um, talking about the collapse of Western civilization and how this had happened before. I don't know if you've seen that clip, um, but it really struck me. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's really um, insightful. And then, and, and so he suggested to me that I watch the Rubin report. So when I got back to Morocco um, that January, so this is a couple years ago now, I started watching the Rubin report. And so as the YouTube algorithm does, 
it eventually put up uh, Jordan Peterson in my recommended list. And so I think, so I think I actually saw some like small clips of his, but they didn't really strike me immediately. It was, it was watching the Joe Rogan podcast, the first one that he did, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot of people first got on board. Gateway for Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't watch it when it first came out because I didn't know about the, the podcast, but I think it was, it must've been in February of uh, 2017. And, uh, I think like pretty early on, you know, after about six or seven minutes, I had that Eureka moment. And it was when he was, um, I think it was that early on that he was already tying together um, postmodernism and Derrida and, and yep. Marxism. Yep. And uh, I'm the kind of person who loves to find connections in things and kind of have, you know, this unified theory of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so although I, un I kind of understood each of those ideologies or, or movements, you know, superficially on their own, I hadn't understood how they tied together. Um, and here was this guy very eloquently and um, persuasively bringing them together. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so, you, you know, this may sound strange to, to, to non-Christian listeners, but I wasn't used to hearing wisdom of that sort, the, the way he was talking about it. Um, intelligence, certainly, you know, on any variety of topics, but, but a lot of the things he was saying, and, and not in that particular instance about the Marxism, but, but later on, the way he was talking, it just had such wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't used to hearing that kind of wisdom about life from non-Christian sources. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, that may make me naive or, or not well-read, but it was, uh, it was certainly kind of, it was pretty um no i think that's a great point because i think that's a big piece of why christians have been drawn to him because he has articulated christian wisdom mm -hmm. and, and i think he's articulated it extraordinarily well in a way that christians identify as christian but yeah. also better than most christian leaders have done yeah. And, and one thing that really struck me about him, too, is his humility. You mm -hmm. know, I, I really like that. Um, he, mm -hmm. he's, he's always pointing out his own, his own flaws and his own weaknesses. Um, and, and, I think, and I think this is also what appealed to a lot of, um, or what, what made him sort of the gateway drug to Christianity for a lot of people, is his, his humble approach to epistemology, you know, mm -hmm. and and, and how, how open he is about not knowing. Um, I actually commented to that effect in a recent Rebel Wisdom video because it struck me that, certainly in my own case, like I won't speak for, for all Christians, but in my own case, I could tend to be dogmatic at times. Mm -hmm. um, I think not necessarily because I was so convinced all in every, in every instance, but because I was worried of... of you know, not having answers for people and then people taking that as a, as a loss in the debate mm -hmm. or what happened. Mm -hmm. So, so it was really refreshing to, um, you know, to hear his complete humility in, in not knowing things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what drew a lot of people to him that were, that would not be drawn to traditional Christian pastors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciated that about him. Um, and, and so I kept watching various clips of his, but I, but it was mostly, you know, interviews and um, and short clips, um, pretty much through the summer. Uh, and then that fall, I well actually it was it wasn't until December I think that I discovered his biblical series, which he he started in May I think. Um, so I discovered his biblical series just before I discovered you. <laughs> um, because so so i started listening to them and then i was kind of thinking man what am i supposed to make of him as a christian you know like yeah, yeah, looking yeah. into the bible in this psychological way yeah, um, yeah, yeah. As, as you put it he's coming at it from below rather than above yeah. sort of god number one rather than god number two yeah and the way he was talking about it really you know touched or struck a chord with me yeah but i was kind of like ah you know shouldn't I be able to get every truth that I need 
from the Bible or from within the church? Like, how is this happening? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so then I think, I don't think I, I actually looked for, you know, Christian takes on Jordan Peterson, but your, your video came up, you know, Christian pastor talks about Jordan Peterson. I was like, yes, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, uh, and the rest is history. So, um, yeah, so that was back in, I think, December of 2017. Um, so I pride myself on being within your first thousand subscribers. Oh, I, I remember you and I knew you lived in Morocco. I, I just wanted to get the stuff in the video. So don't, uh, yeah. cause you were an early one in and, um, and I, it, I can't always keep track of all the names, but you, yeah. I, cause you had a very interesting story and you were from Morocco and I thought how on earth is someone, cause this whole thing, YouTube thing was just a big, you know, what's, what's happening. Someone from Morocco is listening to me. I thought, what kind of crazy is this? So, yeah. And I'm not the only one either in Morocco. No, this you're is- not. I noticed that. Cause then I noticed, Oh, Google tells me where people are listening. And it's like, there's more there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've had, um, not formal, but informal Jordan Peterson meetups here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm, so, so I started something called the Socratic Club, kind okay. of after what, the, what C.S. Lewis did, I think, or, or what, yep. what the English did at Oxford. Um, and I invited along a bunch of friends, about half of them Moroccan and half of them uh, foreigners. And at that time, when I first conceived of it, I think I was the only one of us who kind of knew about Jordan Peterson. Um, but over time, either through my telling people about him or people discovering him on their own, um, more and more of that group sort of began to get on board with Peterson. So uh, interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's really fascinating. Wow. Um, That's amazing. That's amazing. And you know, you know, it was so, it was so cool to discover your videos as well, because, um, I mean, that's the great thing about the internet, right? It draws together. I, obviously has many terrible things about it, but it draws together communities of people um, who love the same things and who would not otherwise um, necessarily find each other. Yep. Uh, so, so especially to find someone talking about Peterson from a Christian perspective and C.S. Lewis, who is, you know, by far my, my favorite author of yep. all time, um, was, yeah, it was fantastic. So, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, and so I wanted to take this, this chance to thank you and I deliberately waited not to put it at the beginning because I knew you might edit that out out of humility. So <laughs> I don't edit anything. <laughs> I'm too. I'm in too much of a rush to edit anything. But thank you. You're very gracious. <laughs> I, do, I do really. I do really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> especially, especially the conversations, which you know is kind of surprising because it's it's not the kind of thing that you would necessarily imagine you would enjoy just listening to two random people talking online. Um, but I think you're, you're very good at listening, which I'm, I'm sure you picked up as, as a pastor, uh, among other things. And so I think, you know, the great thing about that is that it, it, it's, it allows people to kind of shine and, it, you know, you're able to draw out, you know, what people might not otherwise have drawn out of them. It sort of, it sort of it reminds me of what um, Peterson said about there's no, there are no dull people, only only what stupid listeners <laughs> stupid <laughs> interlocutors who think that they're dull. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of yeah. truth to that. Yeah. And, and also I think was, was it in mere Christianity that, that CS Lewis mentions that about yeah. you've never met, you've never met a dull person in your life. Yeah. Every, every person is a creature who, who, if you could see their eternal soul, you would either fall down before in, in adoration or flee from in terror. So yeah, that's a great line. I used it in my sermon yesterday. Um, oh, good, okay. nice. Yeah, no, and and you're right. And that was for me a surprising. I mean, like this whole thing for me, I've just kind of stumbled into it, and mm. then you know start. You know, why not post conversations if people agree to it? And and then and yeah, what what is it with two randos? You know, why why would anybody want to listen to two people just talking? And then I thought. That, that's exactly what YouTube, I mean, YouTube should be, YouTube should be paying me. I'm not going to monetize my channel, but YouTube should be paying me because this is exactly what YouTube is for. And, yes. and, and one of the things that I've always, what I always noticed as a pastor too, is that God, just like second Corinthians says, he deposits in his glory in jars of clay. And mm-hmm. there as a pastor, you meet, you know, part of the reason, you know, we do the Freddie and Paul show is because I want 
some people might look at Freddie and and think the world would be better without him or Nancy or Phil, who's on sometimes on or anyone else who comes on. And it's like, no, no, no. Human beings are amazing creatures. And if we can slow ourselves down and shut up the internal voices, um, mm. we can see we can see the glory of God shine through. And yeah. so to the degree that that happens on my channel, I'm, I'm just grateful. Yeah. So, so that reminded me of the weight of glory, uh, which, yeah. oh man, that is, that is definitely my favorite Lewis piece, I think, nonfiction piece. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah I, I wanted to ask what yours is. I imagine it's miracles because you, you often refer to that. Do you have a favorite nonfiction? The weight of glory has to be up there. Um, but my problem in picking favorites is I usually fall in love with the last thing that I look at, <laughs> which is probably, probably a flaw in my character. I, I love the book. I, I use the book Miracles a lot because I found, I find myself always susceptible to, um, to materialist reductions mm -hmm. and m Miracles helped me helped me i would i listen to materials once or twice a year it helps me resist some rather simplistic reductions that lewis just sort of exposes in that book but the weight of glory just sings one of the things i noticed about lewis and audible has a really nice collection of lewis essays which you, i think i bought it for something like five dollars and it's like it's like 72 essays or something in audible form. There's amazing essays, but he often recycles his stuff. So the grand miracle in the book Miracles, which actually is in a bunch of other of his things too, is just an amazing story where Lewis talks about the incarnation as the missing chapter in history. And mm -hmm. um, that, that for me is a, is a go-to, is a go-to chapter um, of Lewis's. Was that where the quote came from that, that Sherry brought up the other week about um, the hunter was it from that chapter or was that a different one? I don't remember if it's from that chapter, but that quote on pantheism also is something that Lewis used in a number of different essays. Yeah. So Lewis has these elements that as anybody yeah, who, yeah. yeah. Any, anybody who does a lot of this for a living, you have certain go-to things. That's one of yeah. Lewis, Lewis's go-to observations. Yeah. And, and I also found that. So, so I, you know, in California, I'm always, you know, I try to maintain my Christianity. Um, as a pastor, I really should. But so, you know, what, what are the what are the things talking in my ears? I mean, one is materialism, and one is pantheism. And right. so I'm always dealing with those two, those two mm. noisy riders. And, mm. and so, you know, we're our elephants are herd animals. And so we, that's how we're influenced. So yeah. Lewis is very helpful on both of those topics for me. And you know, one of the, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying about the sort of the go-tos and the interweaving. Um, you know, you, you see the same threads in his other work. And uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to Louis Marcos's um, great courses on C.S. Lewis. No, I didn't know there was one. Oh my. Yeah. And it's been out for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. I discovered it back in college 10 years or no, 15 years ago. Um, it's just a 12 lecture one, um, but, but part of it is called, or maybe the whole thing is called smuggled theology. And I really like that because, you know, as I was reading through more and more of Lewis's nonfiction, the older I got, the more I discovered where all these themes in his fiction had come from. You know, it was these philosophies and theologies he'd been working out over the years. Um, so, for example, Till We Have Faces is, you know, the, it's the perfect encapsulation of the four loves, um, which if you listen to, to Louis Marcos, is, he actually talks about it. That's I just I got bought it, so keep going. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, so I won't ruin it for you. I used an audible credit for it. It's like, yeah, that's definitely worth an audible credit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's good stuff. So keep going. But so so the, the quote that, that Sherry brought up, uh, so I, I just finished Miracles about a week ago. For the first time, so, so here's the crazy thing. Um, you know, I, I've been reading Lewis my whole life, 
And, uh, and, you know, he's always been my favorite author. I just love everything he's written, but I didn't always have access to his books, you know, being in various places around the world where you don't have English bookstores. Yeah. Um, and so there were, there were a few of his books that I hadn't read, Miracles being one of them. And um, when I got here about five years ago, um, I'd read everything else that I read up to now, um, but not Miracles. And someone gave me uh, a copy of it. And I started it at the time, but the first couple chapters are very kind of dense and, you know, the sort of the, the mathematical or logical side of philosophy, which does not appeal to me. Um, and so I, I was a little disappointed. I thought, oh, this is, this is going to be a different kind of Lewis book than anything I've known to date. So I put it aside. Um, but after watching your videos and hearing you bring up miracles so much, I decided about three weeks ago or a month ago to, to try it again. I'm glad I did because, yeah, it's like right up there with weight of glory. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so that the quote that, that Sherry um, shared with you, which I loved, it was, I, it was also like one of my favorite quotes uh, from reading it. But right before that, um, let me just read something and see if you – so it says, you've had a shock like that before in connection with smaller matters when the line pulls at your hand when something breathes beside you in the darkness. Now, does that something breathes beside you in the darkness remind you of anything from Narnia? Remember in The Horse and His Boy? Yeah. Jast is going over the mountain pass. Yes. He just, yes. just hears the thing breathing beside him in the darkness. Yes. And I, I that's love one of my favorite, pa that's about the only passage I remember from that book. Oh man, that's, that's, that might be my favorite. Um, Narnia book along with the last battle really yeah maybe because I grew up in Saudi Arabia <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, might have something to do with that but um uh but I love you know reading Lewis's fiction and discovering things from his non-fiction or vice versa um and I, I know about oof, I don't know over a year ago I recommended a book to you uh, but I know you have an insanely long reading list. And so I, I don't know if you got around to it, but have you read Planet Narnia? I, I started reading it. It hasn't grabbed me yet, but I, start, I bought it and I started reading it. No, Paul, you got to read it. I, I know he's, he's very kind of, he's overly academic at the beginning. And, and that, that is his like less accessible version. Um, and it's, it can be kind of off-putting, <laughs> I know, some of his language, but... Oh, you got to get through it because I think it will convince you. I, I started off reading it as a skeptic, but someone who, who wanted to discover more of Lewis's genius. And by yep. the end, I was completely sold on, on the theory. Well, I'm going, I'm, I've got a little trip with my wife this weekend. So maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll bring it. I've got it on my Kindle and I've looked at it, but I'm, I'm such a bad I'm, I'm, I'm such a passionate reader. And what I mean is that I read what I'm passionate about in the moment. It's such a bad thing, but it means that I'm always, I've always got all these books going at the same time, but some, mm -hmm. when something really grabs me, then I just do the whole thing. So, well, I'll take yeah. I'll, that'll, you know, your recommendation just, you know, pushes it up the hierarchy a little bit more. And it's, um, I mean, yeah, like I, I already had the utmost respect for Lewis, but when I read this book, it just like, it skyrocketed and like, I don't know. I, I think, I think it's criminal how underappreciated he is in the Academy yeah. compared to what he should be, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. And, and goodness knows, you know, I, I love Jordan Peterson and he's, I think he's a genius, but honestly, I think Lewis's intellect dwarfs anyone that we have with us today. It's yeah. just, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lewis. No, you're right. And I feel the same way. Lewis, and it's such a weird, you know, one of the books I read not too long ago was a biography of Joy Davidman, which was really interesting, both in terms of learning about her, but also learning about Lewis through her. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a whole nother side of Lewis. Um, was it disquieting? <laughs> yeah, but it was more human, too, because there's a, there's a tendency to, you know, to, to sanctify Lewis too much. Right. And um, yeah, I definitely have that tendency. Yeah. And Lewis was a dude and he was a weird dude. And, 
you know, I, and I get that sense with Jordan, with Jordan Peterson to the April Q and A, and he comes on and you know, hello. <laughs> I just, I just watch him on those Q and A's. I just laugh. He's oh, such a quirky dude, but I, and I love it. I love it. And I got the utmost respect for him and I'm not taking anything away. And you know, part of it is because my whole family laughs at me. They, my, when I die, my family's just going to be telling, you know, all yeah, kinds yeah. of weird things about me. So, <laughs> but yeah, my, my, my brother got, got into Jordan Peterson somewhat. Um, and I think my father has enjoyed some of his stuff. I, I think my mother watched part of one of his videos and, and she said to me, mm, I, don't like I don't like him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. to each their own. Yep, yep, but, uh, yep. But, but coming back to the sort of the planets in Lewis, because it's not even something I really, despite having read the Space Trilogy, it's not something I noticed um, until I read Planet Narnia. And he just, he makes like a watertight case for the, the planets representing the seven medieval planets um, yeah. as they were considered back in, back in that time. Um, but, but it also kind of, for me, it points to this, um, this bigger theme, I guess what Nick would call an axial possession, which I really like that, that phrase of his. Mm -hmm. um, in Lewis, that has been really hitting me more and more in the last four or five years. And that's the idea of sort of the tension between, you know, the Neoplatonic and the Aristotelian, mm -hmm. the word becoming flesh, mm -hmm. you know, and we, and we see so many, so many of those dualities. Um, and I think that had kind of started to grip me even before I discovered Peterson. Um, but like when, when I started watching his biblical series, that just kicked it up a notch. Um, and actually, the month before, before I discovered um, your videos and, and the, uh, the biblical series, um, I started writing a novel. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, no, don't get too excited because it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very slow work in progress. But, but um, doing it is good. Yes. Yes. And well, now that I've, I've put this out here on the internet now I'm kind of, you know, accountable for it, I guess, which sucks, but um, <laughs> there are many unfinished yeah. novels in the world. Oh yes. Yes. Um, but I, I don't know if you've heard of NaNoWriMo. Yes. Na yeah. Okay. So, so a friend of mine here mentioned it to me and mentioned that she was going to do it and she kind of challenged me to do it. And this was just a week before that November of um, 2017, I guess. And so, you know, I've always wanted to write a novel like everyone has. Um, and so a couple of days before it was due to start, I kind of started thinking, oh, well, you know, what, what could I write about? Um, and, and a painting and a poem came, came to my head um, that I've always liked since college. And so I kind of decided to, to base something around that. Um, have you, so, so there's this, this, poem by Auden, W.H. Auden. Uh, and it's about, it's about a painting of the fall of Icarus hmm. by, a, by a Flemish painter from the 16th century. Um, I think from, from Antwerp or something. Um, but the cool thing about it, and, and this is what the poem comments on, is that the fall of Icarus is not the central, the central thing in that painting. It's just kind of off in a little corner while the farmer is plowing his field and a ship is sailing on. And so it was kind of a comment on how suffering just goes on in this world. You know, it's not, it doesn't take front and center. Um, but, but so I really, I, I liked the theme of, of hubris, you know, of, of trying to reach the gods, um, you know, of, of Icarus flying up and getting too close to the sun. And, and Daedalus tell, you know, Daedalus told him, don't go too close to the sun or it'll melt the wax on your wings. Don't go too close to the sea or the, the water from the waves will, will weigh them down and you'll drown. Um, <clears throat> and so at the time, I kind of saw it as a, like a commentary on Aristotle's golden mean um, because I'd been, I'd been gripped with, with the kind of the paradoxes in life and, and finding that middle balance. Um, kind of walking that tightrope between the two. And, and so I started with that, but it kind of, without my meaning it to, it morphed into this, um, 
idea of of the word and the flesh you know of the word becoming flesh and and so you know the um the verse about unless a seed falls to the ground and dies it will not abide um kept coming to mind and and uh, and of course lewis in miracles talks all about that which i didn't discover until until this month um but so, so hearing about kind of order and chaos in Peterson really brought that to the forefront too. And so, so I, I like Nick's phrase, um, phrase of axial possession because until now I would have called it a paradigm shift. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it is a paradigm shift, but I think with a paradigm, it, you're kind of seeing the world through these new lenses. But with an axial possession, it's like you see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Where mm-hmm. the paradigm, sh- like if you wear glasses, the, eventually you, you stop noticing the frames. Mm-hmm. And that, that's mm-hmm. kind of the case with a paradigm shift for me. But with an axial possession, it's just like you see it everywhere and you can't stop seeing it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I started seeing this, this tension in everything um, and, and reading through a book called The Story of Philosophy. Uh, I got to Nietzsche and and he's talking about the, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Um, so again, you know, you see it there. Um, and there, there's another beautiful phrase in the who, book. Who that wrote the story of, of philosophy? Is Will that, Durant. Or is that Will Durant's book? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that's a really good summary of philosophy. Um, it's, it can kind Durant's of drag it. That's the guy. Sorry? I said Durant's an interesting guy. I mean, when you look at his volumes of history. Yeah. Well, and I didn't know any of that until until I, I just, you know, I was looking for kind of summaries on philosophy and that was highly recommended. So I, I, um, I ordered it from Amazon. Um, And then only after reading it, did I discover that he'd written these tomes on, uh, on history (laughs) <laughs> tomes is right my wife bought them it's like honey i'm gonna need some bookshelf space like mm. a, you're gonna read those well i don't know I thought, well, well they'll they look nice on the shelf <laughs> and i started reading his ancient history one i was like Oof. yeah exhaustive yeah. yes so it was a, it was a really good book um it, it took me about a year and a half to get through <laughs> um but but there was this one line, I think he was talking about Spinoza. Uh, and he said um, he had the Northern hunger for truth rather than the Southern hunger for beauty. Mm. I thought, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's totally, <laughs> that's exactly what Europe is, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hence the Protestant Reformation. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the beauty of the Italian Renaissance was all in the South. Um, and so again, this was one of those dichotomies or those dualities that I was seeing everywhere. <clears throat> and, um, and so, yeah, I, I just began to be really fascinated with that. And, um, and, and so that kind of led me to Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand faces. Have you read that? I, that's another one of these books that I'm about fifth of the way into. Okay. Um, and it hasn't, totally grabbed me it was some of somebody at my meetup was is always is perpetually annoyed that peterson doesn't give joseph campbell doesn't say joseph campbell's name enough and you know jordan are you are you not wanting to fess up to you know a lot of dependence upon it but it could be that that peterson isn't dependent upon campbell but he simply has been marking similar things because that happens sometimes i get accused of that somebody once wrote me a big long day why don't you give jung enough credit it's like i hardly i haven't done any work in jung everything you talk about is jungian well maybe you're seeing a lot of jung in what i'm saying and you know yeah yeah yeah, this is gray i didn't read it in a book (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly it you know like i i i started i've been starting to see all these dichotomies or these dualities and <clears throat> several years ago, and it was only kind of in the Peterson talking about order and chaos that that started to come together. Um, and, and then reading about Nietzsche and his, his Apollonian and his Dionysian. Um, and of course, you know, you, you get that in Lewis to a degree. Um, I can't remember 
where he talks about it other than in miracles, but he does, he does bring up the sort of, you know, the father sky and the mother earth and the, that, that sort of um, symbolism. Um, but yeah. Oh, but, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that hideous strength. Um, have you read that recently? <laughs> I have not read it recently. I read it when I probably read it 40 years ago. And so haven't thought okay. about it a lot. And, and uh, Luke Thompson keeps nagging me. I've got to read the space trilogy again. And I do, but it's, it's in competition with a lot of other books on the hierarchy. Worth, worth to reread for sure. Cause, um, cause there's a scene at the end of that hideous strength where the planets come down in bodily form. Right. So again, it's, it's C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis's obsession, you know, as an amateur astronomer, his obsession with the planets um, and the fact that, you know, in, in classical mythology, they each had these, these attributes and these characteristics. Um, and it's, for me, I, th I think this is something I just recently recognized, but that even in, in that scene, again, it's this idea of the word becoming flesh. You know, of and and of course, in that story, it's it's about this. His um, the main character's nemesis is this department at the university that is is doing research, and they have this disembodied brain. You know, and um, and so I see that again and again in Lewis, and uh, yeah, it's it's really fascinating. So so anyway, I'm I'm trying to to work all these things into my novel. Um, cool, but, but it's a very slow process so i i think it's great you're writing a novel i think that's i think that's terrific and keep it up and i don't and there's a few other people that i talk to that are working on novels and i always encourage them to you know it because the i mean at some point you want your novel to see the light of day and you're going to want to see as many people to see it as possible so you're going to have to give thought to how you're going to move up the move up mm. the hierarchy of the great eye, which is popular but, awareness. But on the other hand, um, so, so there's, there's two things I wanted to bring up about that. I, I saw a video, I think it was on the Rubin Report, where Peterson talks about writing, and he says, don't have an ideology and then just paste a story over top of it, right. because that's just propaganda. Yeah. So was, when I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, like... Because, you know, I have this idea like, oh, I have, I have such cool ideas about the word becoming flesh and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, and how to tie that in with art and, and what was going on in the 16th century in Europe and the Reformation, because um, it's sort of a historical fiction. Um, but, but, you know, I, I don't want to propagandize. I want it to be, and, and that's partly why I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, because I wanted to feel kind of more imbued with these archetypes. Mm -hmm. and just be able to have that kind of flow naturally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I think actually probably writing fiction is helpful in making sure that doesn't happen because if, you know, listening to the story of Lewis and Narnia, Lewis tried to write Narnia for a long time and it just didn't go anywhere until Aslan kind of popped in and pulled the whole story through with him. Mm -hmm. And good fiction is like that, in that if, if you keep working at this, at some point, the story should take on a life of its own, and it will get disconnected from you. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you're still doing it, but it's a little disconnected from you. And I think that's where, you know, real art comes from. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's my concern is that I'm, I'm worried I have too much of the, the Apollonian or the word and not enough of the flesh, you know, that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm too, too obsessed with it. Oh, this is such a cool idea. I got to put this into, into the book and, you know, trying to work it in instead of just letting, <clears throat> just letting a story flow. Um, but what, one other thing that came to mind was that, you know, I had been agonizing over like, oh, well, would this be considered literary? You know, would it be, because, because I don't want it to be a pot boiler, you know, I want it to be kind of well regarded and I want it to be written well. Um, but, but a friend of mine brought up the point, you know, I mean, which is a very simple and it's a point that's something we've heard before, but don't, don't write for, 
for critics or for an audience, write the book that you want to write or, yes. or, or create the art that for yourself. Yep. 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 Um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to keep that in intention. Well, and, and keep writing. I mean, one of the things, so I've had some experience in training preachers and what usually happens is people who want to preach, they've got like one sermon pent up in them. And a, now a sermon's a lot smaller than a book. And so they get up there and they, then they, you know, and, and usually it's a mess because mm-hmm. the, the death of a sermon is almost always way too many disconnected ideas. And so mm-hmm. they kind of get up there and they vomit out that one sermon that's been in them for years. And then it's like, then they, and then it's on the stage and you just sit there and, you know, you pick through it a little bit and find a few good things and they say, okay, write another one next week. And they're like, what, what am I going to say? It's like, but it's, it's, it's by doing, and it's by doing repeatedly that actually a lot of this stuff gets worked through and worked out. So, you know, you write this and it might be just always constant rewrite. So you write the chapter and then it's like, well, that sucks. And then you re- you rewrite it or, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's torturous. It's torturous business, but it's, 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 mm. it's holy business too. And so, you know, that's why Peterson is dead on right. And that's why I, I tell people, people like, well, I want to do this. Well, then do it. Well, no, I yeah. want to think about it. No, no, just do it. And as you do it, you'll, I remember when, so my, my wife was a, studied Spanish. She got a degree in Spanish before I went to the Dominican Republic. I had high school and college Spanish, but I didn't learn a darn thing. And I went to the Dominican Republic. And, but we had this little language learning class before then. And the guy said, in order to learn a foreign language, you have to make a million mistakes. So you might as well get started. And so I just butchered the Spanish language horribly. And my wife was just horrified at it. And it's like, hey, look. I'm making my mistakes. And so yeah, have yeah. at it and keep at it and, and don't, you know, wrestle with it until, until it blesses you. Yeah. I mean, language is definitely one of those things where you're, you're not going to learn it just by learning the theory or the grammar. You have to make those mistakes. Yep. And, and from having had to learn several languages throughout my life, I've definitely discovered that the thing that motivates me is is finding those those funny kind of idioms or slang hmm. that's going to make the locals crack up, you know, and then like say, oh wow, you're you're so you know they we all need affirmation, you know. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> those things kind of uh, keep me going in in trying to learn a language. So um, yeah, and de- but definitely you're you're not gonna you're not gonna learn those things, or you're not gonna be able to get them out without making tons of mistakes. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard for me to apply that to the writing process. You know, I go, I'll go whole months without writing because I'm like, oh, no, I, I don't like the thought of just word vomiting out on the page. You know, I go very slowly and I want the sentence to be just right. So I got to I gotta Oh, you're one of those. <laughs> yep, afraid so. Well, there, but, there, are, um, there are word vomiters and there are editors and I'm definitely a vomiter. So, which you can tell from my videos because it's all just vomit. <laughs> Keep vomiting. Well, we, we enjoy it. <laughs> well, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, anything you wanted to get in before? I mean, mo- most of the things would probably take half an hour, but... Um, oh, we can talk again. Yeah, yeah, we can talk again. Um, may- maybe just like... A, well, no, that, that would... I was going to ask you about Owen Barfield's theosophy and how... how um, yeah. yeah, that would take a while. I, I know you're, you're planning on doing a video on that at some point anyway. It'll um, I'll vomit out, I'll vomit that stuff out at some point because I haven't. So someone, see what happens is that I start doing videos, and then a whole bunch of people because we have this natural desire to colonize each other, mm-hmm. and I mean, there's a million people that want to colonize Jordan Peterson because that's the way this stuff works, and so there's but there's only about a hundred people who want to colonize me, and and many of those hundred people have people in history who have colonized them who now want to colonize me. So there's a whole bunch out there of Jung and there's a guy who's using Owen Barfield and there's others using Nietzsche. And so, but lately, and so then there's this hierarchy in my head and, and Barfield rose up the hierarchy pretty quickly last week. And I read some stuff because I've been rereading the fellowship 
which is a book um, um, that yeah, I make yeah, in my videos. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see what's colonizing me, just watch my videos because it's what's in my videos. And I'd actually never heard about theosophy until until you even mentioned it in the context of Barfield, and I still don't know anything about it except that I just looked up the definition, and it kind of struck me that you know, like in in Voyage to Venus, Lewis has his his main character Ransom have this experience at the end that's sort of like you know Campbell's pantheism and 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 what i imagine theosophy would be so i was going to ask you you know what's the difference there um and 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 just something something to keep in mind for our next video if if we're able to chat again is um like i, I know lewis often talks about the you know being brought up into and unified in christ um and but yet retaining that which makes us individual and that being heightened instead of being um dissipated Right. And, and so my, my like, I, I kind of instinctively agree with him, but I don't know why. And I'm wondering, like, what the explanation, what the theological explanation is behind that. So I know you don't have time to answer that, um, but... Well, I can tell you quickly, because our Redeemer is our Creator. And it's creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And that's why our redemption is actually, you were created... And it's an amazing thing within history. I mean, what history does and time does is creates, there are archetypes, there are patterns, but there's also individuality. There's no one like you. I mean, it sounds like wisdom you get from a purple dinosaur, but it's true. There's no one like you. And so God's redemption of you is both Christ and you. And and so... Yeah, I, I think I need to... <laughs> to have a longer video on that but yeah and 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 you know rudolf steiner um my wife teaches at a waldorf school the waldorf schools are all the legacy of rudolf steiner and so i've got some experience with the steiner community and lewis had zero respect for steiner and that community and so now gosh we're running out of time it's really too bad but um so you've got a guy like steiner and you've got a guy like Jung. I mean, Steiner and Jung are coming up in the same stream. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've never heard of Steiner, so I'll have yeah. to look into it. Yeah, look up Rudolf Steiner. There's, there are whole communities that continue to be devoted to him, as was Barfield. And so mm. part of Lewis and Barfield, they had the Great War. And part of what was involved in the Great War between Lewis and Barfield was Barfield's fascination with theosophy and Rudolf mm. Steiner. And Steiner has a lot of really interesting, cool ideas, but Lewis saw it as, well, we'll have to get into that at some point. So, right. um, I, I, but I Jung is in there you know, too. If, yeah, if, if Lewis ever read Jung at all. Do you know? You, I, I have in my Logos Bible software, that's a great thing for managing books, Lewis mentions Jung in his letters. So I know, Lu, I know Lewis read Jung, but he doesn't talk about him much. And I wish he did. So <laughs> that's after we die. And I, we have access to C.S. Lewis and infinite amounts of time. We can talk about Lewis and Jung. We can talk to Lewis about Jung. So, yeah. oh boy. Let's see. Yeah. And further up and further in. I mean, and this is, ah, this is, we just get, that. you know, we just get little chances now to talk. And what we're doing is seeding conversations this is why I can't. It's all in Plato, Paul. It's all in Plato. What do they teach them in these schools? What do they teach them in these schools? Right? <laughs> oh, it's so delightful. I have to hang up because I don't want to step on the next guy's time. No problem. This it's great talk, Paul. This has been so much fun, Andrew. We'll have to do this again. Me too. Thanks, all Paul. Right. God bless Take you. Care. Take care. Me too.